Hey, my name is Will. I play a lot of different games, but one thing I do enjoy is going back and experiencing games that I may have missed out on. So in this video, I'm going to be finally checking out a collection of levels that were created exclusively for the re-release of Mario 3 for the Game Boy Advance. That's right, I'm going to be checking out the e-reader levels for Super Mario Bros. Advance 4, Super Mario Bros. 3. Wait, seriously? That's the full title of the game? Okay, game titles aside, this was a collection of levels that you could only play if you owned the e-reader accessory, and you also purchased a set of cards that unlock said stages, which not every card was released outside of Japan. So these levels aren't something that a lot of people got to experience back in the day, but thankfully they have been re-released on the Wii U eShop and Nintendo Switch Online. Anyway, kick back, relax, and let's talk about the exclusive levels for one of my favorite games of all time. So before we start, let's talk about my background with Super Mario Bros. 3. I'm a 90s kid, so the version of Mario 3 I have played the most is the NES version. I honestly can't quantify how many hours I would have sunk into that game as a kid. So when I learned about these levels, I was pretty excited to check them out. I did get to play the Mario All-Stars version of Mario 3 a few times via a family friend who owned the copy. But I've never actually finished a playthrough of the Super Nintendo version of Mario 3. With the Game Boy Advance version of the game, all I knew that Nintendo did re-releases of Mario 2, Mario 3, Super Mario World, and Yoshi's Island, albeit with insanely confusing names. For the longest time, I just assumed that these were just ports of the Super Nintendo version for a new audience. So going into this, can you guess what the biggest shock was? I mean, it is in the style of Mario All-Stars and not the NES graphics, but... Excuse me, what is that? So Mario has voice lines in this game. Not a lot of them, but they do exist and he says them constantly. So this was the hardest thing to get used to. Back in the day, I played a lot of Mario fan games that were made in Flash, and a lot of them used these voice lines. So it definitely felt strange to hear them in their official context. Anyway, onto the levels. The levels are hosted on a special E-World that features three mushroom houses, each with their own minigame. The minigames here are unique from the ones featured in the original game, so this was pretty cool to see. There's a digging minigame where you basically have to pick a path and hope it leads to the item. A ball throwing minigame to try and pop a bubble for a 1-up. And a balloon fight style minigame that is only unlocked after collecting 80 advanced coins from the various stages. The first five stages in the collection aren't really anything too special, so I won't dwell on them too much. They're remakes of several stages from the original Super Mario Bros., including 1-1, 1-2, 1-3, 1-4, and 2-2. There are some minor differences in these stages, such as the inclusion of the advance coins and the flagpole being purely cosmetic, but other than that, these stages I guess were a way for Game Boy Advance players to experience Mario 1 stages if they hadn't already. So now let's jump to the first stage where things become interesting. Stage 6 is Wild Ride in the Sky. It's a stage that feels like it would fit perfectly into Skyland. Initially, it's an auto-scroller stage, nothing new here, but then you reach the middle of the stage where suddenly the stage starts shooting four bullet bills at you diagonally. And this is why this collection of levels is interesting. Not only are these new official stages, but they also add new elements to keep you on your toes. This section is pretty tricky, and it did take me a few attempts to get through it without dying. Stage 7 is Sliding the Slopes. It's a nighttime desert stage which seems pretty normal until you enter the level's sub-area via the green pipe. This area has angled blocks that allows Mario to run up the walls and end up upside down. This section was a lot of fun and reminded me of the Super Baby Mario segments from Yoshi's Island. Stage 8 is Vegetable Volley. This stage is pretty standard. Oh yeah, except for the Charge and Chucks, Poison Shroom, and you can throw vegetables like Super Mario Bros. 2. Okay, so maybe it's not so standard on second thought. This stage was pretty cool, as I certainly wasn't expecting elements from three other Mario games to be present. Stage 9 is Doors O Plenty. This stage is pretty much like a ghost house you would find in Super Mario World, only it's in the style of Super Mario Bros. 3. It was a little eerie at first, because the graphics for this game are very similar to the graphics from Mario All-Stars. So my brain was like, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look like the ghost house on the Super Nintendo. But I guess that's the thing. The graphics are meant to be if the NES version of Super Mario Bros. 3 had a ghost house, and then said ghost house was ported over to Mario All-Stars. It took some getting used to, that's for sure. 
Anyway, the level is basically just trial and error, going through doors, navigating through the maze, until you are able to fight the Big Boo. So whilst this stage is unique in the context of Super Mario Bros. 3, for those of you that have played Super Mario World, there isn't really much here that you haven't seen already. On to stage 10, Bombarded by the Bombs. This stage is very similar to some of the final stages of Super Mario Bros. 3, where it's an auto-scroller and you have to platform over enemy tank-like structures. But in the second half of the stage, you head indoors into another auto-scrolling section where you have to deal with the bombs and cannons shooting at you. Then you fight Boom Boom as normal, which is pretty standard with these kind of stages. Not really much else to say about this stage, so let's move on to stage 11. Magical Note Blocks. So my first impression of this stage was, oh, it's a nice stage. But then you get to the main room of the stage, and it becomes a vertical platforming section, where there is nothing but musical note blocks, and you just keep climbing up until you reach the top. The stage does throw some flame chomps at you, so it does get a little tricky here, but other than that, the stage is pretty straightforward. Speaking of straightforward, stage 12, the old switcheroo, is a pretty standard desert stage. It does have some minor puzzles with vegetable throwing to get coins, but if you aren't going for 100%, the stage is pretty much just running through P-switch sections and then swimming to the surface to end the stage. The next stage is called Piped Full of Plants. And this is one of the stages in the collection that I had a much harder time completing. This stage would fit perfectly in Pipeland, both in difficulty and design. This one did take a few attempts to get right. A lot of the deaths, I feel like were a result of me not being 100% used to how jumping feels in this version of the game. Since I did grow up with the NES version of Mario 3, I think my muscle memory was getting in the way of being able to do precise jumps without hitting the piranha plants. Oh, also, if this was in the original game, I probably would have entered the stage of a power star to get through it. Stage 14 is Swinging Bars of Doom. So this stage is interesting because, upon first impression, I couldn't really see anything unique. It seemed like your standard run-of-the-mill castle, but then it hit me. The Bars of Fire was an obstacle in the first Super Mario Bros. game, but I don't think they were used in Super Mario Bros. 3. Maybe I'm not remembering it correctly. All I remember are the spotlights of doom that went around in the circle but I don't have any recollection of Bars of Fire being in the game at all. So maybe that's what makes this stage unique? Well, that and the odd Super Mario World enemy and the double Boom Boom fight at the end. Anyway, for any seasoned Mario player, this is a pretty straightforward stage. Next up is Para Beetle Challenge. I think this is the hardest stage in the entire collection. Though Para Beetles aren't new to the players of Mario 3, the difficulty of this stage might be. The stage is an auto-scroller where you must ride and jump from beetle to beetle and do your best to survive. If this stage was in the base game, this certainly would be a stage that you would save a P-Wing for. This was the only stage that I didn't end up finishing, as when I was streaming the playthrough of these levels, I wanted to make sure I got around to trying all of them in one stream. I did get close a couple times, but yeah, in the end, I decided to move on. Let me know if you managed to get through this one. The next stage is called a musical trek. This one is very similar to Magical Note Blocks, only you are going across the stage instead of climbing. Most people won't have trouble with this stage, unless you're like me who didn't like trampolines and note blocks as a kid. So as a result, you end up eating shit more times than you should in this stage. Oh my God. <laughs> stage 17 is Armored Airship. This stage is probably the most standard looking stage of the whole collection, as it feels like most of the airship stages in the base game couldn't really spot anything unique, so if there is something here, it certainly is subtle. The next stage, Ice Dungeon, is a maze in an ice stage that would fit well in Iceland. Much like the previous stage, I couldn't really pick out something unique to talk about the stage. So instead, here's a clip of Mario jumping on a spring. The line that kills me the most is when he picks up the power up. Excellent. <laughs> I mean, okay, some of the stages in this collection don't have a unique element going on, but these stages would still perfectly slot into the base game and almost feel like scrapped levels. So it is pretty cool to get more levels that would fit into the base game seamlessly. With the next stage, Sky High Adventure, I had to go back and play the stage again later on to get footage, because during the live stream, I sort of just flew past the stage. That's the thing about this stage. There are a series of doors that lead to rooms that form the level, but then you can also just fly past it all very quickly and miss it. 
So if you want to get the full experience of this stage, be sure to just forget about flying. In stage 20, Sea to Sky, we get back to the fun of seeing new things. The stage feels like it's set on a beach, which is cool to see. But then we also have the cape power-up make its appearance in Super Mario Bros. 3. And it behaves exactly as you would expect it to, which is pretty neat. The angled blocks also make a return, and the stage makes excellent use of them by forming an infinite runway for Mario to run along to get enough speed to fly. The frog suit also makes an appearance in this stage, along with the Rip Van Fish enemies from Super Mario World. I wasn't really a fan of the frog suit in the base game, but when you have Rip Van Fish chasing you and obstacles to avoid, it certainly made me appreciate the power-up a lot more. Of all the stages in the e-reader collection, I think this one's my favorite. It's a great showcase of how cool these stages really are. It's a shoe-in is the next stage. This stage is designed around the shoe power-up. The shoe stages were some of my favorite stages in the base game, so I was really happy to see it get more screen time. The stage is just using the shoe to perform platforming challenges involving forms. If you're a fan of the shoe levels in Mario 3, you're gonna like this one. Stage 22 is called Slip Sliding Away. Upon first impression, this looks like your run-of-the-mill stage from Iceland. Until you see that the penguins from Yoshi's Island are in the stage. So if you're like me, you would have felt a little bit of panic initially. Because you can just imagine a scenario where you accidentally run into one of them and get yeeted into a pit. But that thankfully didn't happen. This stage also has a section where the screen moves back and forth gaining momentum with each swing until you reach the exit. This section was a bit weird because I don't think I've seen anything like this in the older games. I was also worried I was going to slip into the pit, but again, thankfully that didn't happen. Continuing the trend of ice stages is Ice Cubed. This is another stage that I think would fit perfectly in the base game. Though there isn't really anything unique here, I think I enjoyed the stage a lot, because it did a much better job of being an ice castle than the second castle you find in Iceland as it feels like a ghost house rather than a castle amongst ice levels. Though I generally don't tend to like ice levels, this one stood out because I thought it was a lot better than what was in the base game. Next up is Puzzling Pipe Maze. This is a stage I had to revisit a second time because I feel like I didn't get to experience a lot of it the first time I played through it. The stage feels like an alternate version of 7-9 from the base game. It is very similar in concept, with the only differences I noticed being the addition of the gates from Yoshi's Island, and the sub-area you can only get to by successfully breaking some blocks with ice. If it wasn't for the additional elements from other games, this would feel like a scrapped level from the base game. Not bad, but nothing special. Stage 25 is a towering tour. This one's an interesting one. To summarize, this stage feels like it's the reverse of the staircase level in Skyland. The stage in the base game, you go into a dungeon area and keep climbing up until you reach the cloud area and then continue your journey in the clouds. This stage starts in the clouds and then you have to traverse downwards and end up in a much tougher dungeon to climb down that is full of spikes and time jumps. It's a pretty fun stage that invokes nostalgia and also brings in the snake blocks from Super Mario World. Castle Dash is up next. So this stage reminds me of the stages you would get in Mario Maker, where you have a very short amount of time to clear the stage. So you need to barrel through it as quick as you can. These stages can be a lot of fun, and this one's no exception. The stage also has the return of the angled blocks, which I love, and also the introduction of these red mines. No idea what game these are from. They did feel out of place visually, but as far as the challenge goes, they're a fun addition. The 29th level is rich with ropes. Of all the stages in the collection, this one felt the strangest to me. The stage has wigglers on the ground, and then the rest of the stage is a series of rope climbing sections that are highly reminiscent of Super Mario Bros. 2. It's a weird mix of Super Mario 2 and Super Mario World elements, and not really a whole lot else. Once I got past the whole initial surprise of seeing Wiggler and the Mario 2 elements, the stage didn't really do it for me. Next up is Vexing Doors. This is another ghost house labyrinth, but this one feels more unique than Doors O Plenty, as it's less of a maze and also has unique elements such as the snake block and these new rotating platforms. Again, with this stage, it does take a while to find the correct path, but this one was a little more stressful, as when I did find the correct path eventually, I was running low on time and had no choice but to sit back and wait as the snake block slowly moved along. It's just... This is moving at a snail's pace. So there's not a whole lot I can do about that. <laughs> hey, 
Hey, Mario, why aren't you hurrying up? You haven't got much time left on, on the clock. Why aren't you taking this more seriously and moving with a sense of urgency? So yeah, that did lead to a death from time up, but now that I knew the path, it was easy enough to get back there. The boss is more or less the same as the other ghost house. It's Big Boo, but with less blocks and more holes in the ground. In the next stage, Cape to Escape, you once again get to use the cape power-up from Super Mario World to fly through the stage. The stage is pretty quick as you just keep flying forward until you reach the end. There are a couple of sections that use the angled platforms for some coin collection, and also there are these coins that point upwards to something. I don't know, I couldn't figure out how to get up there, so I just left it. Next up is Groundwork. This is an underground stage that borrows heavily from Super Mario Bros. 2. The stage sees the return of being able to throw vegetables, and now also being able to dig holes like you would in Mario 2. It's a pretty short stage and brings back the Super Mario Bros. 2 nostalgia for sure. The stage does get a little tricky by mixing in enemies from later stages in Super Mario Bros. 3. Stage 31 is called an Aqueous Adventure. This stage features an underwater gauntlet of spikes and spinning blocks. Also, some of them are on fire somehow, so there's that. It's a pretty challenging level that'll be sure to test how good you are at navigating Mario underwater. So now we come to the most detailed level of the collection, Bowser's Last Stand. This stage is an alternate version of the final stage in the game, complete with branching paths. The stage overall felt a lot more difficult than the one found in the base game. The stage begins in a pretty similar manner, but then you get to the fork in the road and that's where it differs. You pick between a path with lava, a path with Hammer Brothers, and a path with Cheap Cheap. I stuck to the path of lava as I felt that was the path of least resistance. The rest of the stage is just platforming challenges and avoiding obstacles such as the Bowser statues from Super Mario World. The final fight from Bowser is more or less the same, unless you take the hidden path that lets you collect another advanced coin. The fight did take me a while to get correct as it had been a while since I had completed the game. Also, I just wasn't used to the movement from the Game Boy Advance version. Maybe I'm imagining it but the timing just felt like it was different. I don't know, let me know if you felt this way too. The next stage is Koopaling Confusion. This stage is very similar to the water tank level at the start of Darkland. The stage ends with a fight with Ludwig, which I ended pretty quickly by throwing a power block at him. Power blocks do two hits of damage to bosses, so that's pretty nice. The next two stages form two parts of a larger stage. Bowser's Airship. The first part mixes things up by having you complete the outside of the airship in reverse. The level fits in with other airship levels, so there isn't really much to talk about other than the end of the stage where you do complete a section that is inside the airship. It's full of hammer, fire, and boomerang bros, but not really a whole lot else. After a boom boom fight, the first part is over, and you begin the second part of the stage where you have to complete an outdoors airship section. This time going in the normal direction, and then again, another indoor section with more boomerang bros. It's not until you reach the end of the second part where you come to the unique thing about these two levels. A tweaked version of the final fight. This is pretty cool. Though the fight isn't different beyond the layout of the bricks, it's cool to imagine what it would be like if the grand finale was navigating a larger airship level where Bowser is at the helm. Stage 36 is called Airship's Revenge. Yep, it's another airship level. This one had a pretty cool layout, but honestly, at this point I was a bit over the whole airship thing. This stage can be seen as an alternate version of Morton's airship as you fight him at the end. Alright, we finally leave the airship stages behind with no time to dawdle. This stage is another fun speedrun stage. It's set outdoors and has a bunch of advanced coins in places where you need to perfectly time your jumps to be able to collect them. I really enjoyed the stage. And finally we come to the final stage in the collection, Treacherous Halls. So, Treacherous Halls is a castle stage that I think could be placed in Giant Land. The stage is a series of platforming challenges where you have to keep bouncing off enemies to avoid falling into the spikes. It starts with the enemies from Giant Land and then increases in difficulty until you get to normal size enemies that are a bit more spaced out. The stage also has sections that feature the flurry enemy from Super Mario Bros. 2 where you have to ride them over spikes. It was cool to see these enemies again. Makes me want to play Super Mario Bros. 2. Anyway, the level ends with a standard boom boom fight. And yeah, that's it. It's also worth noting that E-World also has a castle you can visit to track your collection of coins. So that's a neat little extra for you completionists out there. Anyway, it was a lot of fun to check out these levels finally. And also be able to play the Game Boy Advance version of Mario 3 for the first time. I think the wildest thing about these stages 
is that they're sort of one of the earliest forms of DLC if you think about it. I mean, sure, they were locked behind the purchase of an accessory that didn't take off, and also the purchase of physical cards, but it's crazy to think the amount of attention to detail that was placed into these levels, and then for it not to really catch on. I wonder if Nintendo would have made more levels if the accessory and cards would have sold more. Either way, I hope you did enjoy this trip down memory lane, and hopefully this video got you interested in checking these levels out for yourself, or maybe playing through them again for fun. Be sure to let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this video, as it'll let me know to keep doing more. But in the meantime, if you want to support the channel, the easiest way to do so is to hit that old like button. Or, if you want to see me play the e-reader levels and more, be sure to check out my stream archive channel. I'm also live on Twitch most nights Australian time if you ever want to catch me live. Anyway, that's it from me. If you want to see me talk more about the games I play, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell. Until next time, thanks for watching.